So what are we talking about? Our Patreon. Patreon. We need money. <laughs> <laughs> We're launching a Patreon here pretty soon. At this point, we have kind of no other option than to turn to our fans for support. Playing in a metal band isn't going to make you rich. Long gone are the glory days of multi-million dollar record deals, stretch limo rides, and unlimited bar tabs. Today, most metal bands work their asses off for dwindling financial reward. They juggle day jobs to pay for the recordings, Many tours lose more money than they make, but they do it anyway. With music sales plummeting to essentially zero, more and more metal bands are turning to crowdfunding. Using sites like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and Pledge Music, artists can go direct to fans for support. Last year, Toronto metalcore band Protest the Hero raised more than $300,000 to record their new album. While not every campaign brings in such huge dollars, Bands have used crowdfunding to help pay for everything from pressing vinyl reissues to fixing broken down vans. But last month, when Colorado death metal band Allegion asked their fans for monthly donations to keep them from going bankrupt, it ignited a fierce backlash. Which raises the question, did Allegion go too far? We're so fucked. <laughs> what are the ethics of crowdfunding? Today on Lock Horns, it's a panel discussion on crowdfunding and how to survive as a metal band. Welcome back to Lock Horns, Banger TV's weekly metal debate show. First off, apologies to everyone who tried to join us with the live stream this week. Didn't quite work out. We're going to figure out the problems. But anyway, thank you for joining us here. Today we're doing something a little bit different. It's another panel. We're talking about an issue that we normally don't talk about when it comes to music and art, and that's money. How bands make money, how bands spend money, and all those dirty questions. Speaking of money, uh, we actually have Lockhorn's t-shirts for sale. Can't help but get that plug in there. Whoa. Saw that coming a million miles away, but guess what? We're not doing any crowdfunding to raise money to create the t-shirts. So there's a t-shirt, you can pay for it, and then you can wear it. They're beautiful. Anyway. To help me with today's show, I've got two dudes in the studio who have been with us before. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for your patience. Next to me here is Nick Sewell, uh, who's Hi. been playing uh, music for over 20 years. He's currently bassist for the band Biblical. Check them out. They're awesome. Who ha and he's been playing, uh, sharing the stage with such bands as Caius, Eagles of Death Metal, and I Hate God, and they're about to release their second album. He's also mm -hmm. a designer who's worked on film and music videos, and you might recognize him from a now infamous moment in an earlier episode of Lockhorns uh, for Doom Metal. Check the archive I for that stand by my position. beautiful moment. I stand by my position. Uh, beware fans of Candlemass. <laughs> anyway, and next to him is Daniel DK. We've seen him before. He's a guitarist for the band Diamonds, uh, who successfully crowdfunded their second album, and he has personally booked hundreds of shows and knows all the dirty secrets mm -hmm. of trying to finance a band. Uh, and you'll know him as uh, a, a new personality on Banger TV. You can check out some of his interviews on the channel. Now, obviously, we aren't live uh, this week, but there's been a lot of chat leading up to uh, today's episode about uh, the pros and cons of crowdfunding. And I do want to give a shout out to everyone who, who patiently waited for the stream and are contributing nonetheless. We've got Saskatoon, Victoria, Hail the Island, my hometown, Texas, uh, North Carolina, Maine, Ohio, Finland, Germany, Sweden, South Wales, Suffolk and Chester and London in, in the UK, uh, Iraq, Colombia, Chile, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, Serbia, Jordan, France, New Zealand, and Greg. Wow from Glasgow is joining us. Clearly, we all care about money wherever we come from. Anyway, uh, and as usual, uh, off camera, or sort of off camera, we have Lisa Latasur. Hello, Lisa. Still here. And she has a bell. I do. Which uh, keeps us all in line. Okay, well, let's get to this, guys. Um, there's many different types of crowdfunding. Oh. Um, different ways the bands can do this and and all artists for that matter uh can do it uh, some more controversial than others daniel let's start with uh you okay you used uh kickstarter to help make your second record uh why did you decide to do that 
Uh, well, we needed money. Uh, yeah. It's what this is all about, right, is raising money. And it's a pretty shitty state of the music industry, as there's no secrets. No one's buying fucking records, so we needed some money to make that record. Mm -hmm. um, it worked out. Uh, you know, these <clears throat> companies, Kickstarter and Pledge, themselves are taking a cut of that money. Sure. So, I mean, that's kind of a shitty downside that doesn't often get talked about. Right. But, uh, you know, we reached out to the fans and uh, the diehard fans who support you through the thick and the thin. They throw yep. money at you. You do your best to provide a good product. And, you know, if people are donating the money, I don't really see an issue with reaching out and asking for help. You raise a good point. I mean, uh, who's making the real money with these crowdfunding campaigns? Maybe the companies themselves. Anyways, That's but it, man. you raised five grand. Was that a success? Yeah, it was a success. I mean, obviously, <clears throat> we don't see five grand of that. There's uh, a lot of things that people don't even think about, like, me and the bass player in the band had to go out and fucking buy bubble envelopes and package all the shit ourselves yeah. instead of, you know, just giving a merch company the, the rights to do all that kind of shit. Um, so, yes, it was a success. We met a goal. Uh, we've done it a few different ways. We did that uh, yep. with Indiegogo for that. Um, Diamonds did uh, a Kickstarter to do an independent vinyl release, which was successful. Yep. Uh, we also had a really shitty time once uh, just outside of Chicago. Our van engine exploded on an overnight drive. Like, like fucking out of a movie, fire shooting out of the hood. Right. Really scary shit uh, on the turnpike. And uh, we didn't use a Kickstarter platform. We just reached out to the fans on our Facebook and said, hey, go to our merch store and buy shit, or here's our PayPal address, right. you know what to do. And mm -hmm. we successfully raised a bunch of money to help us do that. Cool. So I think, man, you gotta ask for help. Everyone needs help sometimes. Absolutely, you gotta do it somehow. So Nick, let's bring you in on this. Sure. You've decided not to pursue the crowdfunding route. What, what's your um, thoughts on crowdfunding? I don't have a problem with it. Um, it's not something that I've ever thought of doing for mm -hmm. any of my bands. Mm -hmm. um, but like, I don't really necessarily know what the uproar is because it's like, you know, as you said, it's like your fans are down to do it. So mm -hmm. the fans are the ones who will let you know if you've gone too far, you know, and you're, right. you're being ridiculous, like, uh, you know. Yeah. We were I need, talking about a speedboat. I need a cigarette boat. Right, you know? right. There's <laughs> lines. There's lines in the sand. And the thing yeah. is now with, you know, social media and the digital world we li live in, those lines are all very exposed. Yeah. Now yeah, we yeah. know all of this information that none of us knew yeah. way back when, when uh, the record labels were running the biz and, yeah. and we could only get print magazines once a month. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very different world. But do you think it runs, we were talking before we started rolling, yeah. like, does it risk sort of tampering with the artistic process at all, given I, that, that fans now may have certain expectations because they're supporting yeah, you up front? Yeah. I think that uh, certainly that's a risk, yep. you know, for anything that sure. like, you know, especially like, I don't know if you're like a certain kind of band and like, you know, there's an expectation for you to make this kind of record. Yes. But like maybe your artistic impulse is like, oh, I've always really wanted to try this. Right. And like, you know, there might be, there might be a disconnect between those two things. Right. And uh, so at least for me personally, I've always felt like I would rather. I also don't want to. I don't like exposing the process because like sometimes yeah. the process is messy as shit. Yeah, you know, that's like, very true. You want to see some dude standing in a mic booth like tracking vocals. <laughs> right. Like I'm like just. Right. Take it when it's done right. and like enjoy it when yep. it's like, you know, so, and, and, I, and I'm not saying again, if there's anything wrong with it, I'm just saying for me personally, that's how I'm like, I don't want to share anything until it's done. Yeah. And, and a lot of times like that can take a lot of different forms yep. like, of yep. like, I don't know, you're doing something one way and like you've set a deadline for the crowdfunding, we have to have it in by this. And then you realize you're like, holy shit, I just discovered something that's like the key to the whole record and now I got to go back and redo everything. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we were yeah. talking earlier too, I mean, you know, the irony of this and maybe the worst case scenario is that the, the fans kind of become the new arbiters in a way, you yeah. know, like... Well, they always know, are. They haven't, they, they always, always are. They, all, they, they always, always are, are, I suppose, but, you know, it's almost like in a record label sense. It's like, we're yeah. funding for the... Like, yeah. we're funding this record, yeah. so we have certain expectations of what this record yeah. is going to be. So mm -hmm. it creates a totally different dynamic. I, I think so, I yeah. think so. And, um, you know, only, I think, you know, only the artist knows what the right process is, but mm -hmm. I guess, you know, my apprehension is always like, you know, the process is always so fraught anyway. Mm -hmm. Like, inviting more people into that, I'm kind of yeah. like, 
Yeah. You know. I guess it raises the bigger philosophical question of like, yeah, how much do we want to expose and see? Is yeah. there power in seeing more or is there power in seeing less? Know. Yes, Lisa. Yeah. I love big philosophical questions, but I also love our people who waited in the chat. All so right. we do have some comments. Let's from get the chat. to the let's get okay. to the comments. Uh, here we go. I guess we're starting with the folks who think crowdfunding mm -hmm. is a good thing. So first off, heavy metal cripple. Love it. I think crowdfunding is a good way for fans to connect with their favorite bands as opposed to the old fashioned cigar smoking record exec lining their pockets and screwing the artist over. Dizju is back. It's also good for bands that live in places like Australia where getting label funding for a world tour is pretty much impossible because transport is so expensive. Good point. Uh, Greg Shepard, record labels, smaller labels to drain the pockets of artists who always remain in their debt. I'm all for crowdfunding uh, for challenging the model. It's good, another good point. Uh, Corey Che McGilligott says, excellent topic. Vesperia, Cryptopsy, Huntress, Starkill, and even Rob Zombie are recent examples of where it was done right. You get awesome exclusive merch, and you know that the money is going to make the best uh, album the artist can possibly put out totally worth it. Then you have guys like Papa Roach, mm -hmm. a legion, or all that remains, who totally exploit and ruin the concept. Papa Roach tried to sell their studio for six hundred thousand um, dollars, and uh, all that remains were selling uh, hour-long Skype sessions discussing libertarianism with Phil for three hundred bucks. <laughs> Mm, sign don't me see up. The pro in Holy that. Shit. And Allegiant <laughs> basically wanted their fan base to completely support them financially. Totally lame. Ruins the spirit of it. Uh, any comments, guys, on that last perspective? Uh, there, Corey. If you don't like it, don't don't support it. Don't give them any money. I mm -hmm. mean, that's what we're saying. The, the whole merit behind crowdfunding is if the people are given the money, then there's clearly something to it. It's got some steam in it. Right. But I think, yeah, specifically with the Legion, I think a lot of it comes down to how it was reported. You right. know what I mean? And it was like a super clickbait headline of like, you know, band says, we're going to quit if we don't do this. Like, right. of course, everybody's like, what the fuck? i got to see what they said. But then, you know, you watch like the video and it's like, it's pretty jovial and it's pretty standard kind of, crowdfunding thing and you realize it's a kind of a non-story. Yep. <laughs> yes, Lisa. Well, we actually have Riley from Allegiant on the phone. Amazing. Because yeah. really that's what kickstarted our Kickstarter episode. Ooh, nice. hey. You know, we like a good argument and people seem to be quite upset okay. about what yeah. Allegiant was doing. So we wanted to get them uh, to explain to us from their point of view what, what exactly is going on with that campaign. Of course. Okay. Riley, are you there? Thanks for joining us. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm uh, currently on route to uh, start, our next, uh, start our next tour. Cool. Well, I appreciate you joining us. Obviously, we're we're in Lockhorn Studio here having a chat about the pros and cons of crowdfunding. And I thought it'd be great to get hear from your own, your, your own voice, um, get your perspective on how people um, reacted to your to your recent campaign. What was that like for you guys? Um, you know, honestly, it was, for the most part, really overwhelmingly positive. You know, we've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of support, a lot of, uh, you know, people, uh, subscribing, uh, to various different tiers. There have been a few, uh, you know, pieces of negative commentary, but I don't feel that those have, uh, have really, you know, made as much of an impact uh, right. as, as much as the positive support has. Right, so did you feel that it kind of got blown out of proportion, the whole negative reaction to your, to your campaign, or...? Not necessarily that it got blown out of proportion. I just think that uh, there was just a, a general misunderstanding of what the, the point of it was. I think that a lot of the negative commentary came more from an angle of, like, you know, these guys are trying to get a handout or, or begging for money kind of thing, when really it's just a, a modern-day fan club. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, you had a successful campaign a few years ago where you raised seven grand to fix... Uh, your guys broken down van. So, what do you think? What changed? What was different about the next time around? Um, to be honest, this I can't really speak for the for the the, the other one. I know that was like a one-time thing. That was kind of before my time uh, in the band. Uh, but for this particular campaign, uh, you know, we we just feel 
or we felt at the time that, that we started it that we had uh, reached a point in our in our careers where you know we had stabilized the fan base, you know, to be able to launch something like this uh, and be you know a reasonably uh, positive result. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's it's like I said, it's, it's less of a a crowdfunding campaign more than it is just providing uh, the fans that are interested a platform in which they can support the, the band directly while, you know, reaping the rewards of doing so through, you know, your your regular old uh, teacher based kind of reward system that a lot of crowdfunding campaigns uh, right. come with. I think that since it's on Patreon, there's a lot of, like I said, like misunderstanding and misconstruation of, of the idea that it's like a, a crowdfunding kind of thing, but... Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, my understanding is a lot of what the fans were reacting negatively to was the, the idea of, of supporting sort of a, a, a living wage, I suppose, as opposed to supporting, you know, a specific, uh, a, a more specific needs. And I guess some of the fans reacted saying, you know, we don't, we don't make that much, so why, why should we pay you guys that? Um, how did that make you feel? Totally understandable. Um, you know, that's totally understandable because... But the whole reason for having uh, such a high bar is just that there's, you know, there's no reason to, to, to put a ceiling on something like that that can, that can bottleneck uh, a potential growth in a campaign like this. You know, it, it's not by any means an expectation um, that we have, but it's, it's a, you know, it's just like a, like an aim high, hit high kind of scenario. Uh, you know, if we did get to the point where you know, that many subscriptions were uh, intact and we were making that kind of money, we would definitely be, you know, pouring a large percent of it back into the band for the, you know, the, the experience that those people get from us uh, in return for their, uh, you know, financial support would be, you know, adequately reimbursed. Yeah, I want to read you a couple of comments we got here uh, on the board as that's come in as you've been talking. Uh, Volum Nesti says, uh, tell Riley he's awesome and we love him and the new album is awesome, possibly album of the year. Well, thank you. <laughs> love you too. <laughs> I love you now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a renewed love. And we've also got a question here actually from Diz Chu, who's a regular uh, viewer of Lockhorns, who asks the question, how does crowdfunding work with a label, uh, a label contract? Are there any interferences? Maybe you could um, speak to that. No, it's it's kind of a separate entity um, as far as finances go. Our, you know, everyone on the back end of the Allegiant team has been incredibly supportive and you know super awesome. Uh, you know, there's been another you know kind of misunderstanding that's just a, a spread of misinformation that you know we're getting ripped off by, you know, booking or management or whatever it might be, and that's just just not the case. You know, it's just kind of a, a starving market in general, but, you know, our, our guys over at Circle Talent Agency and Extreme Management Group, they do so much for us, and they're absolutely incredible, you know, at what they do. Yeah, cool. Just a couple more questions I wanted to ask you, you know, um, so what have you heard from the fans that are supporting you? You know, why, why are they helping you out? Um... You know, in some cases, it's because of, of the rewards we're offering. Some of them want to have the, uh, you know, the opportunity to, you know, get a guitar lesson from Greg or, you know, view video lessons from, from band members individually, you know, as, uh, as as we post those videos. Some of them are interested in, in the exclusive content that we have going on, um, you know, for Patreon subscribers. Um, but honestly, a lot of the people have just kind of been like, you know, we, we love you guys. We love your music, you know, mm-hmm. you're uh, it's, you know, an unfortunate state of affairs that bands don't, you know, oftentimes make enough to support themselves as individuals, you know, mm-hmm. outside of band time. Um, yeah. So, you know, a, a lot of them are just glad that we're, you know, trying something new to, to keep the band going. Cool. Last question, then I want to get back to the guys here in the studio. Um, you know, given that, you know, this, this campaign was kind of shrouded with some misinformation, I think some confusion. I mean, what ultimately do you wish fans and the public understood about what it's like to be in a band like a Legion? I mean, what do you want people well, to know? 
you know, honestly, it's it's great. It's great being in a band. Um, like I said, you know, it is just kind of a starving market. There's not a whole lot of money floating around, um, you know, for everyone to be able to to do this and live this lifestyle uh, and live it comfortably. Um, you know, but what I what I think that should be expressed most clearly is that, you know, like I said, it's just kind of a a modern age fan club. You know, the people that are interested in supporting this, you know, we appreciate their, their support so much. And the people who aren't interested in supporting it don't have to. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we appreciate all the support that, that comes in, uh, yeah. whether it's from Patreon or whether it's from buying the album or, you know, streaming it on Spotify, buying merch. Um, you know, every bit helps, and, and we, uh, we appreciate it at all. Cool. Um, quite a bit. Well, thanks for joining us, Riley. I appreciate it. I think, you know, given there's so much information out there these days, it's it's good to hear it directly from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So, you know, thanks for taking the time to join us today. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Thank you so much for having me on. All right. Take care, man. You too. So there you go. Uh, <clears throat> from the horse's mouth. I mean, any, any, any reflections, uh, Daniel, on, on what Riley said there? Uh, he, I think he was being a little civil. I kind of want to chime in and say, you know, what about when you got called a dickless beta male? Uh, <laughs> but, you know, he said, yeah, the response has been overly positive. Uh, yeah, there was totally some really negative response yeah. to what they did, and I think you're trying to get that out of him. You just don't blame him for not wanting to go there. Yeah. But they got called some pretty bad names on the internet. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, the trolls really went to work on them. Sure, sure. Yeah. And, and how about you, Nick? What, what's your feeling about that? Uh, what, well, you know, like, like he said, like the fans are down, mm -hmm. and ultimately they're the ones that are going to let you know like when what's right or wrong. Sure. You know? I think maybe if there's any backlash, it's probably that I think as opposed to like their previous campaign, they were shooting for like sort of maybe a longer, more like long-term sustainable yeah, right. thing rather than like, hey, like let's keep doing this over, a, we want to do this more and all the time. Right. So, yeah. um, you know, again, it's like the fans will let you know, so whatever yeah. floats your boat. I think, I think it's interesting. Um, most crowdfundings really are like, hey, here's our album. It's either A, it's recorded and we need money to press it or, hey, our van's broken, we need money to fix it. This was like, I've never really seen the personal type of fundraiser like this. And I think it's interesting that it's clearly proving to be successful for them. And you know what? I think good on them and I hope that this maybe spreads a little more awareness as to the financial realities yeah. of being in a band. And if they can pull it off, hopefully others in need can pull it off because God it's knows I'm, life, I, yeah. I know a lot of people who could use a lot of help. For yeah. sure. Yeah. Yes, Lisa. Uh, just to respond to, to DK in that there was actually another band that tried a similar model uh, of subscription per month mm -hmm. to kind of support them. And it's a band from Australia whose name I have a really hard time with. Nay, it starts with an O. You know the band I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, you know, they asked for a minimum wage and it seems that people responded pretty well to that, right. as opposed to asking for the average wage, which I mm -hmm. thought was really interesting. Mm -hmm. But um, I think what this is about is sort of like lifting back the curtain a little bit yep. on what touring bands really go through sure. yep. And, yep. and what kind of support they actually need. Because people don't realize that when you go to the show and you pay your 10 or 15, 20 dollars, that the band is actually not making a profit. Yep. Yeah. Right? Well, let's talk about that a bit. Obviously, you guys both play mm -hmm. in bands. Uh, Nick, you know, maybe kind of walk us through, you know, some of the realities of, of playing in a touring band. Well, um, you know, I, when I was talking to Lisa, when we were doing like the setup for this, I was trying to just ballpark out like, you know, what your daily costs are, yep. you know, and, you know, kind of budget like a hundred bucks a day for gas, depending on how far the drives are, you know, depending on how many dudes are in the band, let's say four dudes and you like don't want to, you want to make sure you actually get to sleep. So you're going to have a, like a hotel, say like 100, 120. Yeah. And then, you know, maybe everybody takes care of themselves, but let's just be generous and give you everybody, each dude, 20 bucks. So you're running 300 bucks a day just mm -hmm. to be out there. And, you know, you, and, and that's also like, you're going to be spending that money whether you're playing or not. You know, and it's like the old adage, like if you're not playing, you're just paying. That's so right. just play yeah. as much as you possibly can. Or sometimes and with the buy-ons, you're playing eh, to play. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, that's, that's a different, that's but, a, you know, different like, issue. There is something about that, though, too. Yeah. But, like, that, that's a calculated risk. Like, where you go, right. you know, with a band as a business, you know, any any business, you're like, you know, 
like you have your business. You yeah. like obviously when you started, you would have been putting more and more of your own stuff into it. Like I believe in this. Yeah. It's worth it to go into the hole. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like the same way if you were starting a restaurant or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, you have to make decisions at yeah. some point. Well, and you bring up that point. I mean, to chime in, uh, we had our own experience with crowdfunding at Banger. You know, we yeah. did two campaigns for the Extreme Metal episode because we wanted to do an Extreme Metal episode. Mm -hmm. The broadcaster didn't want to support it after the run of the initial 11 episodes. And it took us two campaigns to run the money for mm -hmm. to to to. to, to raise the cash one because yeah. I think the first time around we didn't really know what our, what we were doing so it took two kicks yeah. at the can but when we raised eighty thousand dollars which is a lot of money but and and I think the optics that we had to work through is people have no idea how much it costs just yeah. to even put an hour yeah. of content on television when yeah. you're paying for music if you want to pay the artists for the songs you're using yeah. for all the archival footage for all the travel and you know we, we we work with good people who are good at editing and we want to pay them because yeah. this is what they do to make make mm -hmm. their living so uh but definitely, like, we had our own struggles. But you turned down a tour recently. We've, uh, I've turned down a lot of tours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it happens, man. Sometimes the offer's just really not worth it. Um, yeah. Dude, buy-ons are the worst. Yeah. And I think that that's important to, you know, we're talking about pulling the curtain back. And, you know, there's a lot of fucking smoke and mirrors yeah. in the music industry. For those who don't know, watching this, like, buy-ons are a real thing. Bands pay money to play shows and do not get paid for those shows. Yeah. You know, you want to go on tour with a respected band in Europe, it's not an unrealistic number to be told, mm -hmm. you know, you got to give us 25K or you can't come on this tour. Yeah, because right. they know, like, the exposure, Yeah. you know, and certain bands, if they have, like, label support, right. the label's going to be like, no, 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 if we get you in front of these people, then... We'll recoup later. Sure, that's they're right. asking you to invest in the long sure, term. Sure, that's which yeah, of course that's is true. Yeah. And you know what you just said earlier with uh, you know referring to either Sam's business or a restaurant. Like yeah. when you invest money and you open a restaurant, you do yeah. it because you see a lot of successful restaurants around you. It seems like a viable business. Yeah. Uh, bands today, unfortunately, don't seem like that viable of a business investment. A lot of bands that I grew up as a younger thrash guy listening mm -hmm. to who I thought were the gods of the genre yeah. like now broken up because they're broke or mm -hmm. you know you read stories about them fucking living on the street or in their parents apartment and yeah. basements apartments and like mm -hmm. you know like in, investing all that money into music I don't really see the like to spend 25 grand on a tour there's no real guarantee like who has that worked for thus far and that's why I've turned down Quite oh, a few by no, no, They're no, insane. No. Lisa, do we want to go to the boards or we got some comments out here we want to read? We do, but something yeah. I thought was, was actually really interesting uh, was one of our regulars uh, from Newfoundland yep. was talking about the idea of crowdfunding a tour. Right. Right. So paying in advance so that a band could come to a place that they might not right. otherwise get to. Well, let's read the comments. This is from M. Seabrook. I crowdfund concerts too. I live in Newfoundland and we don't get tours. I can relate. Vancouver Island, nobody came to the <laughs> island uh, as much as they do now. And we don't get tours through here because it's so expensive to get bands to the island. I crowdfund for tours. I mean, has this happened? Is there a precedent for this? I, I, uh, I, I've seen smaller towns or, or further more remote places right. offer larger sums of money to get bands because right, they know they can charge more for the ticket and more people yeah. will come because it's it's always like the joke when, when you're on tour and you pull up into a small fucking town you're like well the show's gonna rule tonight because we're the only fucking thing to do yeah. and there's you know nothing else going on yeah uh, sure. everybody in that room will be into it <laughs> dude <Yeah>. stoked because <laughs> they yeah. don't live in fucking toronto new york or la where spoiled yeah. brats like us spoiled brats like us <laughs> Metallica at the Opera House. That's yeah. right. But you've come over, I mean, Danny, creative ways. I mean, I understand you offer guitar lessons as mm. part of a crowdfunding yeah. campaign. Yeah, I can't, I can't ever take credit for that idea. Tons of people have done it before right. me. But um, just thinking of innovative ways to make money on tour, uh, as you were saying, if you're not paying, if you're not playing, you're paying. It's very true, man. Mm. You got to sleep somewhere on tour when you don't have a show. Um, so I have. Uh, offered guitar lessons at different tiers of prices for different packages ranging from like 40 to 75 bucks if you want to be like the super fan and get everything kind of thing mm -hmm. um, and it's just a way for I mean I'm sitting there all day in a venue doing nothing but literally playing guitar and warming up or right. sitting in a restaurant you know burning a hole in my pocket with the no money I have so mm -hmm. why not try and cash in and make a little cash while I'm on the road and I got the blessing of my bandmates to do it Maybe they're jealous, maybe they're not, they won't tell me, but, uh, you know, it's... They get their cut. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 360 deal. Yeah. 
Um, I think, you know, obviously crowdfunding campaigns are happening across all genres of music, but maybe let's steer towards metal in particular. I mean, I think metal's kind of an interesting time, you know, the maidens and the metallicas of the world that are making a lot of money uh, aren't going to be around for that much longer. I think it's we're going to really see things change, and for the average band, it's much it, it, it's much harder. Um, you know, do you think metal requires crowdfunding more than other genres because of these realities? Do, Nick, do you have thoughts on I, that? I mean, I think so. Like, part of like what's with the internet is like there's just so much more content competing for your attention. You know what I mean? There's like there's like a million bands and yeah. just like the sheer numbers is gonna dilute the available for like the music fan. Well like, yeah. it's like, well I like these guys a little bit better and that's all I can support. So mm -hmm. um, I think it's all just a function of right. of that. But maybe the flip side of that, Daniel, like what we've seen perhaps with uh, a legion, is there's this possibility to take advantage of that. Oh yeah, that for sure. That loyalty no, there is, is, there is, is the downside is. of that. Niche, yeah. but, niche genres and niche markets are niches yeah. for a reason. Sure, yeah. sure. But then you, you wonder too, and uh, you know, let's say like all those people that are that are supporting a legion, like how many bands would they be willing to simultaneously support in an endeavor like that? Right. I think that's a qu that's a question, mm -hmm. right? Of yeah. like, you know, you're willing to commit to like this one thing. It's like, well, but these other guys in North Carolina, they're really good too and they need your, you know, it's like, yeah. how far until that doesn't work either? That's right. There's know? a lot of competition for There's your dollars as a fan up front, right? Yeah. And talking yeah. earlier, like it was, you know, we've always paid for music. You walk into a store and you yeah. buy an album mm -hmm. in the in the old days and now I think maybe the difference is that it's 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 seen as an investment rather than a product. Certainly in right. the case when you're asking to like support someone's living yep. wage. It's sort yeah, of like, yeah, well yeah. now you're you're kind of you're kind of put in the position of being an investor. And if you're an investor, you want something for your return. Mm -hmm. It automatically puts people in a different mindset then. It's true. You know, sure. I just want to go buy an album by my band because right. I, lo I fucking yeah. love them. Yeah. I think the most interesting thing that's come out of uh, speaking to you before uh, sitting down in this room was when you said if you were a 13-year-old guy going to buy a Sepultura shirt, you weren't buying a Sepultura shirt because you knew that Max and Igor needed your money. You were buying a yeah. Sepultura shirt because you wanted a fucking Sepultura shirt. Right. Yeah. Right. I think yeah. that that's a very interesting point of with the you know, a flip in the dynamic. Absolutely. Time. You know what? What are they really buying now? The whole idea of what you're actually spending your money on has changed. Yeah. And this is the pros and cons about knowing everything about uh, about what's going on with with your band, right? Mm -hmm. Like I was saying earlier, like if you're gonna if you're gonna download an album for for, for free, yeah. don't be a fucking hypocrite and turn around and say no one should crowdfund right. to support yeah. because yeah. it's got to happen. It's got to happen somehow. Lisa, do we have some more uh, comments on the board? We actually do. There are people chatting from around the world right now, even though we're not live streamed. Amazing. Uh, because we promised that we were reading their comments and we would include their them. loyalty. So. See, their loyalty is. here. Greg okay. Shepard, crowdfunding may only work for established bands who have that wider reach. It requires upfront investment mm -hmm. uh, to advertise a crowdfunding campaign. That's a good point. It might it's not true. be helping bands that literally have no profile. That's yeah. a good point. Horror Master, I think it all depends on the situation. Like if a band really needs the help, then a couple of bucks would help. But if the band wants to do dumb shit, like getting high, then fuck no. <laughs> Horror master. <laughs> Put it this way, a lot of bands never would have got crowdfunded in the old days. <laughs> it would have been very different. And Wookie Dookie, my favorite uh, screen name, I, I'm all for it as long as there is a deadline. And if the band doesn't hit it, uh, we get the option to get our money back or wait X number of more days. Uh, no one wants to be winter sun. Ooh. That's the metal term of the year. Oxford Dictionary does their word of the year. We should do our get, get the aloe. Someone uh, just got burned. <laughs> further on the winter sun, and we'll get into this. Diz2 is back. I think Yari from Winter Sun really abuses the crowdfunding model and his nuclear blast uh, contract. Guys, uh, for those that don't know, what happened with Winter Sun? Uh, well, they they like make fans wait ten plus years for records. Yeah. Right. Like uh, 
You know, before you, bands can do that once they reach like legacy level. It's like, right. yeah, Metallica, eight years for records, sure, whatever. Yeah, but like, sure. your fucking Winter Sun, like your yeah. your second record, you made everyone wait ten years. Right. But I think I think everyone's kind of. And isn't he asking for money to like not make a record, build, like, build a, stu a studio? Yeah, he wants like to build a studio yeah. so he can have full creative control over his guitar tones. He goes. There's like this huge rant on Facebook. If you haven't read it, I suggest reading it. He says <laughs> it. Uh, the actual quote is: "Third-party studios have never worked for me." Right. Like you know, because that the way that everyone else records music in the world isn't good enough for right, Yari. Right. So Yari word of Mirba. warning: Don't be too precious if yeah. you want a crowd yeah. fund. No. I never Apparently. thought we'd put Papa Roach and Winter Sun in the same sentence right? ever, but I think we may have just did. When it's there is a line. There's yeah. a line in the sand here. Uh, I guess so. When asking for something is too much. Yes. In Lisa. Papa Roach's defense, which is something Ooh, I've never said dying. in my entire life. Whoa. It's a first for everything. I think putting their studio available for $600,000 was a marketing angle, right? right. Like we're talking about it because they had this ridiculous perk. One of the first times I heard about crowdfunding was years ago. What was it, Josh, um, the drummer, who was in like Devo and Nine Inch Nails, I can't remember his name. Mm. You know, he had all these ridiculous things you could pay to like go for lunch with him at like P.F. Chang's or whatever, but it got all the media talking about his campaign and getting them people to go to his site so they could give their five, their ten dollars. Right. I think Papa Roach is probably doing the same, mm. selling their studio for six hundred thousand dollars. Interesting course, point. No I mean, the residual it. effects of the Allegiant and Winter Sun sort of debacles <laughs> might be that more people know about these bands <laughs> as a result yeah, yeah. of their of their controversial crowdfunding campaign, sure, yeah, which sure. of course I don't think they ever planned. If they did, they're truly genius. Brilliant. Like, Apparent, apparently, um, you can pay. I think it's five hundred bucks to have a phone call with Ric Flair. Really? Yeah. And I, guys, I'll be right back. I know, I know. I'm kind of like... <laughs> I was going to say I've spent $500 in worse ways, but I actually don't think I have. <laughs> <laughs> All res due respect to Ric Flair, uh, yeah, sure. old school fan. But um, maybe we should uh, sort of pull out the crystal ball and, and, and look into the future here. I mean, what do you guys... Is there a risk of crowdfunding fatigue here? Like, where do you think this is this is going? Do bands have to just kind of get more creative? What 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 do you think? I don't know. Nick? I don't know. I, I again, I was sort of I was trying to look ahead to that in the last segment when we were talking about like you know yeah. how many, like how many bands is the average fan willing to like yeah. support? No, and while at the same time like throwing down dough for like. You know when the big records come out, you right. know. So, right. Right. and it's really hard to see what's going to happen. You yeah. know, because like you said, like what's the next generation of bands that's going to like of that super strata level of bands that's going to take over yeah. when the Slayers and the Metallicas like go away? I'm yeah. like, I, I actually have no idea. It's going to be a totally different climate. What, yeah. do you, what do you think? I think you? there's yeah. a lot of uncertainty there. I mean, like yeah. what happens when you know Joe, music fan, no longer has any money to support the. 25 Patreons that he's supporting. Yeah. I think there's a lot of uncertainty in that. I think there's uncertainty on what happens after Metallica and Slayer are literally no more. Yeah. Do we get another Metallica and Slayer or is heavy metal just away from the mainstream? Mm. Um, but I think that this all really ties into a whole can of worms that we should either talk about or not talk about, which is like just the sad state of the industry as a whole. Yeah. And that all genres. <laughs> all genres, yeah. far transcending, way past heavy metal. Um, yeah. That music, record, industry, and the word industry, mm -hmm. it needs a massive reform. Um, yeah. You know, people don't buy music, that's fine. That's mm -hmm. a reality, it's never gonna change. I don't think that record sales will ever, ever soar like they used to. Mm -hmm. But if that's a, re we need to accept that as a reality and fix it. And streaming is not the solution. Right. Well, um, one one thing that I always find like really interesting, I, I was talking to a friend, and they sort of brought up that um, for the average, like you look at like all of history, the average life of a musician mm -hmm. was traveling, playing. You're like a bard. You go town for town. You like sure. sing for your supper, yeah. whatever. And it's really only in the last like. 80 years yeah. where there's ever been this thing where you don't have to do that. You can have this like extra thing that yeah. someone will give you money for and you can just like show up and play once in a while. It's a really high profile thing. And it's like, yeah. so part of it too is like a bit of a return to like the natural state of affairs for yeah. 
you know, it's like, oh, you're a musician, so yep. you play all the time. No, I like, agree. I've <laughs> often thought about that. Like yeah. at its core, music is live, is a live experience, yeah. and and that's where music started, and maybe that's where we're going, and maybe in the long long yeah. game, maybe that's not such a such a bad thing. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to say is I think we spent a lot of time today talking about the bands mm -hmm. and what the bands should do and yeah. what the musicians should do. I think we also really need to talk about dare I say the responsibility of the consumer or the fan. Yep. Like listen, if you're going to benefit, people talk about the, the benefits of the internet sort of democratizing information and mm -hmm. empowering people. Well, there's a flip side to that. Like you've got, I think it requires a certain amount of responsibility and therefore mm -hmm. if you like music, it should be supported. Mm -hmm. And I and I think that that's a big part of the problem. I think a part is is the young people that are coming up have this perception that this should all be free and that's a huge uphill battle we, we for we for recordings for recordings yeah at the same time it's like you know people seem to like to buy shirts sure you know and they like to and even like young people i think like they they put a priority on the live thing because they know that it's like yeah. an in the moment thing it's not an not experience. not you know yeah i don't know the record that yeah. your friend has and this song and watching video it's like they can actually, yep. it's, it's really like a bit yeah. of a state of the affairs with like yeah. how we interact with all media well, right now. It's like you're looking for like that There's snapshot. There's a reason why Live Nation like, is a seven, $75 billion company. Exactly. It's because the live, uh, the live experience is becoming all that much more important. Yeah. Daniel? Technology's progressed to a point where fucking new laptops don't have CD drives on them. Why are we still selling compact discs? Right. Mm -hmm. So... Yes, people don't want to pay for the music. That's obviously apparent, and technology is moving forward. I don't know why the music industry, which I think is very broken, is still stuck in this idea that we need to buy fucking CDs. No one's buying them. Like, stop making them. Stop with fucking CDs. No one's buying them. Yep. Let's figure out a way to monetize off streaming. That's the only way that people yeah, are going this, to music this, for the rest of history. Right? For, for, for the greatest irony future. is we Sorry. were the closest with Napster, and we've been <sighs> trying to get as close ever since. I think maybe we should go to the board and then wrap it up. Lisa, we've got some more comments out there. We do have our final comments. Uh, people seem to think crowdfunding is okay. Okay, MC Brook is back from The Rock. I would like to see more crowdfunding. As I said earlier, I think this is the future. More viable than streaming services, crowdfund to finance late and labels to distribute. I mean, you're a fan, you get to pay for what you want and don't pay for what you don't want. Delicious dishes, I don't think there are too many. Let labels get a little competition. That's good, I would agree with that. Artur Felipe Castanha is back. This will last as long as there are fans willing to support bands, old and new, but metal will always be a more DIY music, and we could possibly make the argument that metal is more robust yeah. well, in the well, long run. Will it, Artur? <laughs> yes, will it? Yeah. There, there were some fans pointing out that you could never do a crowdfunding for a black metal record. Right. Because people would be like, why do you need more than $5? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, thanks for the discussion, guys. Thanks for having me. Sam, thanks. You're always welcome back. That was great. Uh, thank you off camera, of course, Daniel, Andrew, and Craig, and Lisa. Uh, thanks for watching this. Sorry about the, uh, the streaming problems earlier. Please subscribe to Banger TV. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, you can just click a button, but it'll help us get to the next level. Uh, Lockhorns is back next week with symphonic metal and the return of uh, Lindsay Schoolcraft from Cradle of Filth. Thanks for joining us on Lockhorns, and see you next time.